All right. Welcome, everyone. We are going to let our attendees start to filter in here. If you would like to, you are totally free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Make sure in the chat that you set your chat to appear to everyone and not just to hosts and panelists if you want other people to see you. Otherwise, just we'll see you. Um, but welcome, welcome. Uh, introduce yourselves. Say where you're coming in from. Tell us what the weather's like. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chris, how's the how are things in um, California right now? <laughs> Fortunately, I see sunlight outside. It's uh, it's been pretty wet here lately, uh, but no real big problems with flooding yet. We did have some problems uh, about this time last year, so uh, hopefully the rain will just uh, kind of get blended in over time, so the ground can soak it up. Yeah, I um I am going to be changing into shorts and a t-shirt after this because it is 85 degrees in Texas in February. I don't know what's going on, but uh, we're going to be spending as much time outside as possible. We've got some people coming in here now. Uh, Vanessa saying hello from Orlando, 71 degrees in Orlando, Tri-City, Washington, Patrick Rolland. I know that guy. Um, hey there from Denver. Patrick, good to see you here. Um, we've got uh, Margaret, also from California, Cloverdale. Uh, Chris Miller, where's Cloverdale in relation to you? Uh, Cloverdale, I believe, is more towards the Central Valley, so just over a mountain range from us. If I'm not mistaken. I might be. It sounds familiar. I mean, yeah, that wasn't really fair of me because California is <laughs> ginormous, and I know like not everyone from California probably has every city memorized, so sorry for putting you on the spot there. No worries. Um, I'm in the... I'm just south of the Bay Area. Sometimes they call it the Silicon Beach uh, in Santa Cruz. So we're on the central coast. All right. All right. We got Andy Tate here from the UK. Um, so you're, you're uh, what, having some dinner while you're watching us, I guess. Welcome, Andy. Um, hello from the Netherlands, Tamara. Uh, thank you for being here. We have another person from the Netherlands, Eric. Love having people from the uh, other side of the Atlantic joining us here. Uh, Sacramento, Isla Waite uh, coming in from Sacramento. Uh, Isla, good to see your name come up again. Uh, yep. Uh, Red Wing, Minnesota. Wow. So many people coming in at this point. Uh, really appreciate all of you being here. Um, and we're excited to get started here in just a minute or two. And yeah, we got a fellow Santa Cruzian here, Jim Phillips. Good to see you. All right. We got Gene coming in here from Jersey. Still cold over on the East Coast, as to be expected. Howdy, Jim. I love seeing a howdy as a Texan. Uh, maybe you're pandering a little, maybe you're not, but I appreciate it. Um, and hello from Florida, Karina, good to see you. Uh, thank you for being here. And we're gonna get started here in about one minute, just give people a little more time to filter in. Um, and maybe as people, as we're wrapping this up, um, Paula, our amazing behind the scenes person is gonna come out from behind the curtain here and maybe just give us a little bit of housekeeping information before we get started, just to make sure everybody knows what to do if they have a question or they need to chat about something. Yeah, um, so welcome everyone. Um, just a few reminders. If um, you want to chat and send the message to everyone, make sure make sure you toggle on your options just to go to everyone. You're most welcome to message just the host and panelists, but just remember just to toggle that. I don't I know Zoom webinars does that for default. So um just a quick reminder. And um for any questions that you may have that come up during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature so that we can keep track of them and answer them at the end of the talk. Um, that just make it, makes it easier for us. And I think that is it. So you guys can get started. All right. Very excited to get started. Um, and if anybody needs it, this event is being live captioned by our friends at Texas Closed Captions, and we really appreciate them being here today. Um, so that is live human captioning, not auto captions. 
Um, what I'd like to start with is just to introduce our topic and myself very briefly, and then I'm going to let Chris Miller introduce himself. Uh, we got two Chris's here today. We'll try not to confuse you too much. Uh, so I'm Chris Hines. I'm the COO at Equalize Digital. Uh, today, the other Chris Miller and I are going to be talking about small steps and big impact, achieving accessibility compliance and risk mitigation without breaking the bank. So we're going to provide a lot of perspective, a lot of information up front, and then we're going to dive into more specifics and try to give you things that are actionable that will let you take action. Just very briefly, uh, who we are at Equalize Digital. Uh, we are a hybrid software and service company that focuses primarily on accessibility in the WordPress space. I'm going to turn it over to Chris Miller now and let him introduce himself and also Launch Brigade. All right, thanks, Chris. Yeah, Launch Brigade is a full service digital agency and uh, I'm one of the founders. Uh, I manage the team there. And I'm also an AI practitioner, so uh, I like to call myself a geek with social skills. So uh, <laughs> thanks for the intro. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to advance this here. And uh, Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what we're going to learn today? Sure, sure. So today we're going to learn a lot. Um, this is a huge topic. I remember when I first uh, delved into this, I was surprised at what I didn't know I didn't know. Um, so we're going to cover what what, what is website accessibility so that it kind of everybody's on uh, the same level of knowledge. We're going to go through the different standards and laws that exist because there's a lot of ambiguity out there in the information. We're going to cover the regulatory and legal actions. Um, we've got a bunch of tips and tricks and tools and stuff so that people can uh, self-help and, uh, and get into compliance. And then finally, we'll do some, uh, some Q&A. All right. Awesome. So I think an important place to start is just helping everybody get on the same page about what we mean when we talk about web accessibility. So first and foremost, and I think the most simple way to put this is web accessibility is just having a website that can be used by everyone. And that's bold everyone or capital E everyone. It means literally everyone. So what do I, what do I mean by that, right? Um, I mean people maybe who are having various abilities or disabilities, right? That might be different from myself or Chris or, or anybody else, right? We're all a little unique in terms of what our needs are when we're interacting with the web. And in terms of disabilities, there are some different ideas that I want to share. So there's the idea of colorblindness, right? So if we're just conveying information to a user with red and green, right? And they're colorblind, they may not be able to discern if we're saying, you know, yes, no, good, bad, right? If we're discerning or we're trying to convey information with only color, or if somebody is deaf or hard of hearing, uh, maybe they need captions or audio transcripts if it's audio or visual content. Disabilities can also be temporary. So maybe you're right-handed and you broke your right arm and you can't use a mouse or a trackpad effectively for a little while. You might be relying more on your keyboard or some other device to interact with your computer and the web. Um, or honestly, and this is the case for many of us from time to time, maybe we've had just a really tough few days. We haven't gotten enough sleep. We're under a lot of stress and we're not thinking clearly. Maybe we're finding it hard to absorb complex information or organize our thoughts. Right. So that's what I mean when I say it can be used by everyone, no matter what their circumstance or situation is, the technology adapts to the user's needs. I also want to reflect on the idea of varying devices or technologies. Right. So we hear a lot about responsive design, responsive websites. Right. And that's talking about different devices, phones, tablets, laptops, desktops different operating systems, Mac, PC, Android, different browsers. There's a lot of different browsers that people use, whether it's Chrome, Edge, Safari, I use Brave. And maybe you are using different technologies entirely to interact with the web. So maybe you're low vision and you're using a screen reader and your computer is actually reading what's on the, on the screen to you versus looking at it with your eyes. And that's how you're perceiving what you're interacting with through your technology. And then of course, there's access points, right? So are you on the latest gigabit fiber connection or are you in a less developed area relying on older technology? Maybe you're still on 3G or maybe you're using, you know, on old lines like an old cable connection or something that's really slow. The technology needs to adapt to the user is the core point of this. So 
my point in sharing all of that in some of those examples is that accessibility features and the ability for technology to adapt to users' needs in these ways impacts way more people than you think. So according to a recent World Health Organization study, about 1 billion people in the world or 15% of the entire world's population have some sort of disability. These might be disabilities that are overtly visible to an external observer, or they might be invisible, right? And approximately one in four US adults have a disability. People with disabilities spend about $200 billion in annual discretionary spending, according to the US Department of Labor. So that's just in the United States. I think it's important to note that these are very large audiences, large numbers of people that are interacting with technology every single day. And I wanna turn it over to Chris now to just talk a little bit about the idea of accessibility standards versus laws. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, so there are several different definitions out there. Uh, Americans with Disability Act is the one that everybody's heard of, and that is actually a law, and it really doesn't go very far in articulating what it is that we're supposed to comply with. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act has been around for several decades, and it was updated around 2010 to include websites. Um, similarly, Section 508 is a law, and um, that applies to government agencies and companies who provide services to government agencies. Uh, again, that's, that is a law, um, but does not tightly define the standards by which the rest of the world is supposed to comply. Uh, there's something called WCAG, which I believe is currently in version 2.2, and this is really the only thing that provides some kind of standard uh, for us to comply some metric to measure against to give us actionable items to, uh, to be able to implement this on the websites. Um, in addition, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, the US Department of Justice is uh, unofficially adopting WCAG as a standard. Uh, there's been talk about this, I guess I can't speak formally on that. And uh, the Office of Civil Rights also uses WCAG to measure uh, websites that are in the higher education, uh, higher education institutions who get uh, accessibility complaints filed against them. And uh, lastly, in California, we have something called the UNRWA Civil Rights Act or UCRA. And what this does is it uh, extends the Americans with Disability Act a bit more and clarifies what some of those requirements are. All right, so uh, I guess you, you might be wondering which companies uh, does this apply to? Does it apply to me? Uh, you know, as, as a blanket guidance, um, if you sell products or services, uh, ADA Title III may apply to you. Uh, they bucket the companies under this broad term of uh, public accommodations. Uh, you can see retail stores, banks, hotels. I'm not going to read all, all the bullet points here for you. Uh, but it is a wide category and uh, they disclaim this uh, it includes all of these entities, but it's not limited just to this list. And I do want to just share this briefly. Uh, we both Chris Miller and myself are not attorneys. The employees of our companies are attorneys. We don't practice law. So I'm going to share some more detailed information about laws and standards in the coming slides. But I just want to caveat that with we're not attorneys and you should definitely speak to an attorney if you are concerned about your compliance with any of these laws and what your position is. Hopefully that's a fair thing to say. And we're gonna go ahead and dive right in because we do think that this is useful information even though you should vet it with a more official source. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the accessibility laws in greater detail that are on the books, both in the US and abroad that I think are the most important ones to pay attention to, at least in my professional opinion and in the professional opinions of our company. Uh, first is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, uh, section 504 and 508 specifically. If you do anything in government or with government, you may have heard the term section four and 508 previously. So uh, what Section 504 says, and I'm just going to quote this briefly, is no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall solely, by reason of his or her disability, be excluded from participation in, be denied, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. 
So I think that's pretty cut and dry that whatever the federal government is doing, it needs to be accessible is another way to put that. And then Section 508, put much more simply, just essentially bars the federal government from purchasing or procuring any sort of electronic or information technology products or services that are not fully accessible. And that's enforced by a variety of different U.S. government agencies, a couple of which Chris Miller mentioned already, like OCR or Office of Civil Rights um, for higher ed, among others. Um, and then we have the ADA, which gets thrown a lot, around a lot, and a lot of people have heard of this law and as it pertains to web. Um, Title II of the ADA indicates that communications with persons with disabilities must be, quote, as effective as communication with others. So under the law and with a lot of these lawsuits that reference the ADA, this is kind of what they're referring to, since a website is, uh, a, I think we can all agree, a form or a method of communication. Um, that website needs to as effectively communicate with individuals with disabilities as with anybody else. And then Title III of the ADA deals with public accommodation of people with disabilities. And the ADA itself is primarily enforced with lawsuits from private citizens. We're going to go into some more detail on this in a little bit. Um, the interesting thing about the law itself is that it because it's an older law, it does not mention web, but there's this very long history of case law going back years and years with thousands of successful suits against companies who were discriminating. Then we have the Unruh Civil Rights Act in California, uh, which is, as we've said before, an extension of the ADA. And then the other one that I wanted to mention um, it, are the international laws. The one I really wanna focus on is the EU Accessibility Act. So many of you might remember a little while ago, we had this thing called GDPR, uh, the EU consumer privacy and anti-spam law that has impacted a lot of websites, even here in the United States, as well as globally, and how they process data, how they deal with customers, how they handle opt-ins to email lists. Uh, the big side effect of GDPR has been that many businesses globally are adapting to those standards, even if they're not necessarily operating inside the EU, like they're not headquartered in an EU nation. Uh, and there are other countries that are following these standards now too. In fact, there are approximately 17 countries that I could find, including the US and California, where similar laws have gotten adopted. Uh, with the EU Accessibility Act, I, in my estimation, it will probably flow in a similar fashion where EU is leading the charge here. And then the rest of the world and other countries are going to eventually, and probably not in too short order, follow suit. Um, so the EU Accessibility Act, just a couple of quick facts about it. Um, this impacts and requires organizations with more than 10 employees or more than $2 million in revenue that can conduct any form of commercial activity in an EU member nation to have an accessible website. It's enforced by individual EU member states and also opens up litigation by EU private citizens against the owners of the websites. There is a regulatory cliff coming in June of 2025, so that's about a year and a half away or so, uh, where they will start to allow this to open up for complaints as well as enforcement of this law. Um, the impact with this is expected to be quite significant. Um, there are other international laws that I've listed here. The slides will be made available after the presentation if you want to reference any of those. But in the interest of time, I'm going to let uh, Chris Miller here take over and talk a little bit more about lawsuits. All right. Thanks, Chris. Hey, I'm glad that you brought up GDPR uh, because in the privacy world, you know, right now there are just a handful of states in the U.S. that have enacted their own privacy laws. And California is one of them. Other states are following suit, uh, and I, you know, if we're using that as a guide. It's possible that uh, in the U.S., individual states more and more will be enacting their own uh, specific accessibility laws. So, um, yeah, GDPR is definitely uh, taking a hardline approach to privacy, and uh, I expect they're doing the same on, on accessibility as well. Um, so, you know, as far as the lawsuits go, look, you know, we're not mentioning this to everyone here because we want to scare you. You know, we're just, our role is to, to educate and to share the knowledge that we have. Um, and one of the resources that we use is a website called UsableNet. And they've done a good job of tracking the lawsuits and, and the numbers are kind of frightening. Um, 2023, 4,600 accessibility lawsuits have been filed and 224 just in January of this year. 
Um, as we can see from the numbers, there are some uh, repeat offenders as well. Um, and we'll, there's a technology called overlay that we'll discuss a little bit more. So when uh, we refer to uh, the companies that are already using an overlay, um, we'll, we'll provide some more information on that. And as we said, you know, the uh, states that have their own privacy laws, top ones are California, New York, and Florida. Not, not really surprising. All right. Uh, and so just to look at a breakdown, um, e-commerce is, is the largest group today that is getting targeted. Um, I think, uh, did, Chris, did you use the term drive-by lawsuit? I think I was saying yeah. ambulance chaser. Um, so uh, the, the problem with these lawsuits is that if you're found in violation, there's a limited number of things that you can do uh, to prove your innocence. Um, it's problematic. And so they're able to, to file these lawsuits and uh, to claim that some, uh, uh, someone has been harmed and, and to uh, attempt to collect a judgment from you. Um, in e-commerce, the reason this is the low hanging fruit is because in order to purchase those goods, you have to go through a purchasing process on the website. And if someone with an impairment is unable to do that easily, if their barriers are getting in their way, uh, that's a problem. Uh, but this extends to other, other types of businesses. And you know, I think we're in the beginning of the waves of, of this action. And so this pie chart is gonna change over time. You know, Once uh, e-commerce is not the low hanging fruit, they'll move on to, to other types of industry. So we see education there, um, food service, and you know, we've worked with a lot of restaurants. We all know that restaurants are struggling even after COVID. You know, these are the companies that can least afford to to deal with these things, and you know, they're they're a piece of that uh, pie chart there. Um, and healthcare, you know, obviously, uh, you know, everybody has a right to access healthcare, and accessibility just goes uh, hand in hand with that. Um, I want to run through some numbers here again, uh, as Chris Miller already mentioned, the point here is not scare tactics. Uh, I'm sharing this because I genuinely think it helps frame the investment in accessibility in an interesting way. So the cost of an accessibility lawsuit to a small business, and by the way, these numbers are from real world attorneys, as well as data aggregated by DQ, which is a very well-known and respected company in the accessibility space. Um, small businesses can expect to invest between $19,000 and $45,000. Uh, that breakdown is, um, you know, there's plaintiff law firm fees, there's the defense attorney fees, there's the uh, ensuing cost of a site audit and remediation um, that comes out of the lawsuits, typically a requirement. And then um, they're thrown in there is also potentially damages. Um, so, and then on the large business side, if you're a very large business, um, again, this is based on public data of uh, high profile accessibility lawsuits and what the legal fee breakdowns were, um, where they had to disclose those. But what it doesn't include is the sell settlements, which are often private and not discussed because people are under some form of NDA for those. But I thought that these were some interesting numbers to share. Um, and at the risk of sounding maybe a little reductive, one of the reasons I'm sharing these numbers is to kind of ask the question or pose the question, would you rather invest in improving the access of your business or spend, you know, potentially way more money just making attorneys be able to afford their next house or boat, right? Like, I, I think that we would all agree that one of those is a better choice than another one. Not that I have anything personally against attorneys. I just think one of those is more productive for society. Um, in terms of why accessibility matters, I think I want to just segue into this a little bit, that there are real tangible benefits that we've seen in investing in accessibility. So... First and foremost, like we've just been talking about, is risk mitigation, but that is far from the only one, right? Um, there's also the idea of better SEO. So if your website is uh, more open and available to potentially 10, 15% more people, that is deeper engagement. So people are able to use the website better. They're going to click more links. They're going to engage with more of your content after landing on your site that's going to result in a lower bounce rate in terms of SEO metrics, if you don't mind me throwing a few of these around, as well as time on the site. 
the algorithms, the great algorithms we all worship are going to take note of this and you can very easily see your rank increase because your website is more user-friendly and users are better to are able to better engage with it. Uh, the other thing uh, from an e-commerce perspective or even just from a lead generation perspective is more sales or more conversions. Again, if your website is inherently more usable, more potential customers are going to not encounter an obstacle, right? So the, the comparison that I like to make here is imagine you have a bricks and mortar business and you've placed an obstacle course directly in front of your business's front door that prevents 10 to 15% of your customers from entering your store, if you have a retail store. In what world does that make sense, right? So since in our online world today, a lot of the ways that people interface with our businesses is through the internet, this idea, I think, carries merit, right? The idea of reducing barriers, increasing the ability for users to engage. I think the other one requires a little bit more long-term thinking and personal reflection, right? But it really is the right thing to do for your feather, fellow human beings, but also for your future self. So one thing that I like to think about with this is that um, I personally am aging into needing more and more accessibility features. You already see the gray hairs, right? Um, and I am, like when I'm, when I'm older, I want to be able to have an internet to engage with that is accessible to me. If my vision starts to fade, if my hearing starts to fade, whatever it is, right? I wanna make sure that the internet that I age into is going to accommodate me, be usable for me so that I can engage with content so that I can spend my money, all of those things. And so I think that this is something that we're not just doing for our customers, we're doing it for ourselves and our future selves. All right, thanks, Chris. Yeah, you know, you make me think about uh, going to restaurants and looking at paper menus. Um, I've been told uh, for every 10 years we age, the font size that we read should be 10 points larger. And it never ceases to amaze me. I go to restaurants and they have a, the, a very small, very fancy font that's difficult to see, even in daylight with my glasses on, much less, you know, dimly lit restaurant. So I can know your audience, right? Um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, some things. Now, this is a, a bit related to marketing, and I think this is important because if you're selling products online, uh, you you have probably seen since COVID uh, that the amount of traffic that you're getting to your website has probably changed. The number of those visitors who are converting has probably changed. Search engine optimization is not something for the elite anymore. Everybody's doing it, and we're all being over-marketed to. And it, it's making it difficult for everyone in every industry to be able to sell. And one of the things that came from COVID is this big shift to being online more. And, you know, the, the customer demographics are changing. They, you know, it's like from, this is from the uh, Harvard Business Review. Boarding customers is just like online dating. Um, oh, and by the way, there are links to all these sources uh, that uh, we're quoting here uh, in the slide deck. So you'll be able to see that. Uh, when we send the deck out. Um, so, you know, your customers expect to go to your website. Uh, they want to learn everything about you, about your products and services, everything they need to know to make a purchasing decision. And that's both B2B and B2C. Uh, nobody wants to talk to your sales guy, you know, unless they're genuinely interested in buying the product. And if you don't provide the information that they need to understand on your website, they're going to go to your competitor. Um, you know, this quote here from uh, from McKinsey, 70 to 80% of B2B decision makers prefer to do everything remote and to do uh, self-service here. So, um, you know, this is yet another reason why uh, having an accessible website is important because more people are, are making decisions based off of what they have on your website or what, what they don't see. And uh, there's no magic wand, um, you know, True story, um, my first career out of high school, I was an auto mechanic. I was back in the 90s and uh, actually late 80s, dating myself here. And, uh, you know, working in an automotive shop, it's, it's a different culture. Uh, the service manager that I work for uh, came out, and criticized me once. He says, well, you know, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. 
and he's right. You know, a lot of times we're in a hurry to just get things done, but you know, if we have to do it twice, it's going to cost more. Um, so, um, you know, as, as a company who provides website building services, um, most of the conversations that we have when somebody comes in and they say, I need accessibility, um, often they're saying, you know, I, I know like we work with a lot with WordPress and they found free plugins out there and, uh, the free plugins don't, don't actually solve this problem. Uh, you know, they're, they're well intended. Uh, but they can actually act as a liability because if you have a, a plugin on your website that doesn't actually solve the problems, you're sort of admitting that you know that there's a problem, right? Um, so generally speaking, uh, plugins are not the way to go. Let me uh, let me refine that with saying, you know, a plugin that is intended to fix the things on the front end that people see without you having to do the hard work to fix it underneath the hood. Um, there certainly are plugins that allow you to identify the problems with the website and to be able to go in and, fi and fix this stuff yourself under the hood. So important distinction there about uh, plugins. Um, the next uh, approach is what we call paid overlay services. And I mentioned these earlier. Um, there are several companies out there. And what they do is they um, put some code on your website. And so when a visitor goes to your website, this code runs inside of the visitor's browser and uh, tries to fix some of the obvious problems. And part of that fixing is that that code that's running on that person's browser that's visiting your website, it has to go to the company that provides the overlay. And it's trying to fix these problems in real time over and over again. And one of the, the caveats to this is that it can slow down the page load times. Like if you've ever gone to a website and it's not rendering, and you happen to notice the lower left-hand corner, it says connecting to Google or some third-party website. Um, that is an indication that uh, the website can't load because there's some resource out there on the internet that is not available for some reason. In the uh, SEO world, we call that render blocking resources, which is not, not good for performance. Now, that's just from a functional point of view uh, for form performance for your website. Uh, um, what these tools try to do is to fix low-hanging fruit, uh, maybe adding some contrast to, uh, to fonts uh, so that they're more readable. They give a little widget that uh, a visually impaired person can click on. They can make some adjustments on how the uh, website appears. Um, so there are some good things uh, that, that these uh, overlay services can do. Um, they're certainly well-intended. Um, another one that comes up is... Uh, using an AI service. So if if you have images that don't have what's called an alt tag, like a text description of what is in the image, these services can try to use AI to fill in the blanks. Like hey, it's a river with some reeds growing out of the, the grass or, or whatever, right? Um, you know, we all know from, uh, from using the AI tools like ChatGPT, it's not perfect. It can get things wrong. Um, so that's uh, that's one of the considerations there. Um, but uh, what I found very compelling here that I just learned recently is that uh, the people in the community that have these visual impairments, they're using software on their computers and their devices to try to help them to navigate this world that was primarily built for people without impairments. And it turns out that overlay services in, in certain circumstances can actually conflict with these tools that they're already using, right? So, you know, again, there's no magic wand. These overlay services have their place. And we'll, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to, to give an overview of, of what that solution looks like. And finally, you know, it's elbow grease. You know, all our parents taught us about that. You know, there's no, no substitute for the hard work. And uh, that means uh, going into your website and identifying what those problems are and then going and, and fixing them. And we'll be talking shortly about approaches to be able to do that. All right, you're not alone. Uh, we, we all suffer from this. And uh, it is a marathon, not a sprint. And what we mean by that is that your website is constantly evolving, preferably people who work for you or constantly posting new content to it to keep your website fresh, to make sure that Google is finding interesting things to put you on, on page one. And 
you know, well-intended putting content out there, you can introduce new problems in the website if you don't know what to look for. And uh, there are tools that can help you to identify uh, the, the problems as they come up and so that you can correct them. Um, taking the first step is not hard, it's critical. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit about, uh, you know, adopting a accessibility culture here shortly. Uh, establishing an accessibility posture, it is publicly proclaiming that we know about accessibility, we care, here are the things that we're doing about accessibility, and this can be as easy as a first step of putting an accessibility statement on your website. And the big thing is, is, you know, you're not going to fix this overnight, uh, but if you take small steps over time, eventually you'll get there. So what are the steps? We've kind of split this down the middle. I'm going to start on the testing side of things because that's something we do a lot of. And I spent some time thinking about what are three things that almost anybody could do to get a picture of their accessibility and to start finding some things to fix. The caveat with this is that they're all very quick tests. It's not a comprehensive audit that you would pay a professional to do, but it will give you an idea of your accessibility standing and it will give you plenty of things for your team to work on if the tests uncover problems. If the tests come back perfect, the important thing to know is that no automated testing solution can find 100% of the problems. So there still could be issues there. However, the plus side or the upside of that, right, is that if you fix everything in some of these automated tests, what you find, you will be significantly, and I mean that in a big way, you will be significantly more accessible than you might have been previously and probably, statistically speaking, compared to a lot of your competitors if you're in a competitive business space. Because the reality is, as we saw on the previous slide where Chris Miller was sharing some information, 96% of websites have very easily detectable accessibility problems directly on their homepage. So if you can find those automated tests, you can stand out. Um, what I want to start with is WAVE. So this is the acronym that stands for Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. This is a industry standard. It's been around for years, very trusted tool. And it is just a free browser extension that anyone can install on Chrome, Firefox, or Edge. And this that underlined text there on the slide is a link. Um, and essentially, you can install this on your browser. You can go to any web page on the internet, preferably your own homepage to start, and just run this extension. And it will give you a 100% free report on a page-by-page -page basis of a bunch of different potential issues. And I'm going to demonstrate this very briefly here in a minute. But that's the first thing you can, anyone can do. Anyone can do this if they have access to a web browser uh, and a computer. And Andy Tate says, using Wave all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the next one. And I am, I am plugging our product here for Equalize Digital, but uh, our accessibility checker tool for WordPress has a free version that any of you can go install just by going to your WordPress website. And if you have a login for the back end, you can log into the back end, go to plugins and search for accessibility checker, find our tool and install it for free. It will scan and save an accessibility report on any individual post and page that you click the save button on, including saving as a draft. So if you're drafting new content that isn't yet published, you can check it for accessibility before it ever sees public view. Um, the free version has the option to upgrade to a premium version with a bunch of additional features for companies with large websites. And I'm going to show this again, just very briefly to show what that looks like as another option. This requires a couple of extra steps compared to a browser extension, right? But it is a level deeper and it keeps a report right there where you're doing the editing, where you're doing the actual work. So we think it's very valuable if you have a WordPress site. And number three, we all, or most of us at least, use keyboards. And your keyboard is actually one of the most powerful accessibility testing tools in your possession. Can you, using only your keyboard, get to the contact form on your website? Can you, using only your keyboard, add a product to the cart in your online store and check out and purchase it, doing a test purchase, using just the tabs, arrows, space bar, and enter keys? 
It's a fun test and a very educational test if you haven't tried it before. And anyone can go do this on their website and see. Um, so without further ado, let's do a quick demonstration. And I do have a browser window prepared that I'm just gonna drag over. So hopefully this is going to show up. Looks like it did. This is just a demonstration website that, that I've set up here um, that is a just a generic homepage. This happens to be using uh, Cadence for WordPress. Shout out to Cadence. Um, and as you can see here, we just have a homepage with some demo content set up. And the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run Wave. You can see up here, I have the browser extension for Wave installed. If you have this installed in your browser, uh, depending on your browser, the link for Wave might be in a slightly different position, but I'm using a Chromium-based browser. I'm just gonna click on this. And as you can see here, it scans the page using my browser and my own computer's resources, and it outputs a report right here. And so you can see here, just in the summary tab of the Wave report, we have errors, contrast errors, alerts, features, structural elements, et cetera. It highlights all of this. And if I scroll down the page, you can see it's added some little icons to explain things. And if I click on any of these, it'll explain what it is. If I want more information, um, and I'll go into that a little bit as well, like how deep in this do you really need to go if you're like the owner of the business, et cetera. But um, you can see here on the wave report as well, there's um, some additional details about what the alerts are, right? So, oh, you know, if we have some technical people in the audience, you can see this page has a skipped heading level. Um, or we have some suspicious link texts. You can see here, we have three links that say read more. Well, if I'm a screen reader user, um, and this web page is being read to me, all I hear is link, read more. Well, read more what exactly, right? Do I really know where I'm going if all the, the only thing the link says is read more? Maybe I need to add some additional descriptive text to this link um, via a technical means, right? So that's just a quick example of Wave. The next thing I wanna show you, if I were to go into the back end and just edit this page is what Accessibility Checker looks like. And again, I'm gonna be very brief with this. I'm just trying to give a high level idea. But if you install Accessibility Checker and you are in the edit screen in the back end of WordPress, as you can see we are, if you go to the bottom, you can see the Accessibility Checker report. So if you're familiar with like Rank Math or Yoast SEO or any of the numerous other plugins that can provide you with additional reporting features in the back end, we're very similar. Anytime you update or save the page or post, it gives you this nice report with a summary similar to Wave, only this time it's right inside the editor, which is really handy. And then if you go to the details tab, it will show you various things. The nice thing about this too, is if you aren't sure what something is like, hey, what the heck is ambiguous anchor text? I don't know what this is and I don't know how to read code. If I click view on page, it'll take me to the front end and it'll put a nice pink box around what the problem is and give me a front end explanation of what the issue is that's only visible to me. So again, this is a way to empower your content teams to be able to uh, find this information, to act on it, and to do the, the work, right, of starting the accessibility journey. I'm gonna disable Wave, and the final thing I wanna show you here is, um, and just gonna do a quick page refresh, is the keyboard navigation. So I'm going to start on this demonstration site by just hitting the tab key on my keyboard. So here's my first key press, here's my second one. You can see in the top left here, that it says skip to content, right? So that's a skip link. So if I'm only using a keyboard and I don't wanna to have to tab through this entire navigation menu, right? And waste a bunch of my time every time I can skip to the content. And then as I tab through, you can see, I can clearly tell visually, right? If I'm a seeing person uh, where my focus is for keyboard. If I want to engage this dropdown, I can hit spacebar and I can start to tab from the drop, drop down. But you know what? I changed my mind. I don't actually want to be in that drop down. So I'm going to hit the escape key and you'll notice that my focus went back to the menu. And as I tab beyond the menu and through the page, you can see that focus state changing. You can see that it's scrolling me down the page and highlighting links. And depending on what the interactable element is, I'm using my tab key, my inner key, my space bar, or my arrow keys. So again, you don't need to be a seasoned accessibility professional to be able to look at a website and say, you know what, I think I might have some problems or I might not have some problems. But the, the important thing here to also note, right, with any of these testing things is 
you don't have to be a developer or a CTO, but if you are a developer or a CTO, you can dive really deep down into this stuff, right? And you can understand the specificity of what the problems are. But if you're the general manager, if you're um, the owner of the business who is really trying to just stay at a bird's eye view and not get down into the nitty gritty, this is the perfect time to just be like, hey, employee that I've delegated this to, hey, web agency that I've delegated this to, this is a priority. I can see myself that we have problems. This is the outcome I want. I want, you know, I want to want, I want to run wave on my homepage and I want to see perfect green score, right? Or whatever it is. And so it's very easy to just run some quick tests so that you can understand your high level position and then you can delegate. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Chris Miller here to talk a little bit about some organizational steps that we can yep, take. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so um, this is, you know, the part on adopting an accessibility culture, and, and Chris Hines has already alluded to that, is, you know, you really need to get your whole team on board uh, in watching out for this, right? Uh, you just can't have one person responsible for making sure that everything's in check, and everybody plays a role, technical and non-technical. So, to the extent that you can train your staff and to delegate these tasks, that's super important. You know, having more people, more eyeballs on this, more people taking action will only benefit you. Um, you can leverage trainers and training programs as part of an internal program to be able to educate all of your staff. Um, you know, this is part of this accessibility posture that I mentioned earlier uh, with the, uh, you know, putting the accessibility statement on your website. Um, and then uh, automate scanning and reporting. You know, it's, uh, it can be out of sight, out of mind. You know, the manual tests are great if you remember to run them. Uh, consider uh, having, you know, as part of your website monitoring, hopefully everybody's monitoring their websites, you know, if it goes down. Uh, these are things that can be added to do a monitoring solution uh, and send you weekly reports like you might get if you're using uh, SEO tools, for example. All right, uh, so uh, standard operating practices, that's what SOPs are. Uh, we're all supposed to have them. You know, that's another uh, work in progress, I think, for most companies. Uh, so, you know, update your owner's manual for your, for your company and uh, start to add these processes. Like, we can't just expect our employees to, to know what we know uh, and to implement this stuff. Uh, it's good to document it, to have a routine, a checklist that they can go through like, okay, I'm going to add content before I hit the save button. I'm going to go through this checklist and make sure that I've covered all the bases so that things are uh, reasonably clean as they, they get published. Um, document everything. This can be important uh, from an audit legal perspective. So if you were to uh, be subject to litigation on uh, accessibility, uh, the more documentation that you can have about you know, this is when we started our journey, these are the steps we took with our employees, this is how we address publishing content, all of these things will play in your favor to show that you're actually walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Um, from a technical perspective, uh, when we talk about replacing themes and plugins, you know, one, one thing I like to say is the best thing about WordPress is anybody can use it. And the worst thing about WordPress is anybody can use it. And, you know, there are a million free plugins, you know, like we adopt a lot of websites. Uh, you know, when we, we see a website that's just got, you know, dozens and dozens of free plugins, you know, it's just a huge, huge red flag. Um, these plugins can actually create a lot of the problems or prevent you from resolving the problems that you're having. So doing a technical assessment when you're going through and scanning through the site, like, you know, what do I need to do to solve these problems? Is it just a matter of me going into an editor and changing something I can do with my keyboard? Or is there something more going on here? Um, you know, swapping out plugins might be a little bit easier uh, than retheming. You know, if, if you have a theme that is really working against you uh, with accessibility, then it's probably time to consider uh, replacing that theme and, and maybe freshening up your design at the same time. Um, lastly, uh, I got Hobo Dan here. Um, I found him on the internet. Uh, I, I saw something on Facebook uh, 
about a week ago, this guy doing these crazy lifts of, of weird objects, you know, looked like he was going to throw his back out, but it was hilarious to watch because he was on a unicycle. And uh, so I guess that's a thing on the internet. So uh, I have to give Hobo Dan a credit here because I uh, did a screen grab on that. But uh, my point is, you know, look, if, if you find this hard, uh, if you don't have the time, like find somebody to engage to help you with this, to get you on that path so that you're taking little steps over time to get to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I'll add here um, is talk to your team members. If you have a team, maybe somebody on your team is really passionate about this and they want to be an accessibility champion inside your company. Um, and you can delegate that responsibility to them and they can help push you forward because they they really care about it. And that opens you up to just the high level understanding of, are we making progress, right? And holding that person accountable. Uh, we got a little bit of discussion here. So we, we mentioned overlays earlier and Chris Miller shared a lot of valuable information about that. Um, but I wanted to address some specific questions and maybe we can just take turns answering these, Chris, um, about our high level thoughts. Um, the first question is, uh, can an overlay make your website 100% accessible? Um, in my opinion, and in the, in this opinion is supported by, uh, the disability community and by numerous hundreds, many hundreds, 800 plus, in fact, depending on if you look at certain things like the overlay fact sheet, accessibility professionals that are credentialed and very experienced say, no, an overlay cannot make your website 100% accessible. That doesn't mean that overlays have zero value, right? There may be instances where they're appropriate, which I think we'll talk a little bit about, but I think that those instances are very limited and it comes with so many caveats. It can be dizzying at times, but uh, Chris, do you want to speak to that first question if you have anything to add? And then maybe I'll let you lead with the next one. So we don't just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think if you have a large website with a lot of pages and you're just performing very poorly, uh, it, you know, an overlay, particularly if you have some ability to pick and choose what you want the overlay to fix and not fix so that it's not making it worse, it can be part of a long term strategy um, to, to gain you some ground in the short term. Um, most of these overlays are priced, you know, that I think they're reasonably affordable if you have a small website, but as that website grows over time, either in page count or traffic, that amount of money uh, in, increases what they what they charge for it. And you know, Chris Hines and I were talking about this the other day. Um, you know, it's like search engine optimization versus search engine marketing. When you put great content on your website that places in the search engines other than the initial investment that you made to do that, it's free. Like you're not paying for that traffic to come to your site because you invested in that website. With search engine marketing, you know, I'm referring to Google ads here. Well, if you pay Google to, for you to place in certain keywords, you're gonna drive more traffic to your website. And the minute you quit paying Google, that traffic goes away. And I think there's an analogy here that, you know, overlays uh, fill a similar, similar role is, you know, it's like a, a Band-Aid or kind of a kaleidoscope that you overlay on your website that will fix things while you're paying for it. If you quit paying for it, all of those changes go away. You know, and I think about like uh, using AI to generate alt tags. If, you're, if your website has hundreds or thousands of images and it's just too much work for a human to go in and individually update all of those, you know, the overlays do that in real time, but they don't save those changes to your website. And when you quit paying for that subscription, that gets taken away. So eventually, you know, you need to uh, to go in there and do that hard work. And and certainly if you're doing any new content, you would be well served by making sure that any new content, any changes that you make to your website have that accessibility in mind as, as you're doing the work. Because while you're in there, it's a lot easier to do that than to go back over it later. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Chris, I'll let you lead on this one and then I'll follow up. Uh, what, at a high level, do people with disabilities think of overlays? You know, that's a, a good question. Um, and I think, you know, you taught me this, that, you know, when I first heard of accessibility, I think of people that um, are visually impaired, like they have blindness and maybe they can't 
make out the things on the page. You know, I hadn't even thought of people with color blindness. They can see the page just fine, but because of the color choices, um, they're, they're not able to make out the text. And look, we all want beautiful websites that are engaging and pull people into it. And it's a fine line to walk between you know, a website that is accessible and also appeals to, you know, a, a larger market. Um, you know, I have a friend who, uh, from high school, we still keep in touch and he uh, experienced uh, some vision impairment, uh, pretty severe actually later in life. And I know that, you know, he's using screen readers and he's struggling to deal with the websites. And so, you know, he, he's like my go-to guy because he's somebody I know personally you know, that can tell me the kind of issues that, that he's experiencing. So it's, it's absolutely impactful to him. Um, some of the, you know, when it comes to like, okay, make the fonts contrast more so that I can read them. Okay, great. That's an easy thing. Um, you know, the AI image uh, alt tags, you know, well, that can be useful, but there's like a use case where it's actually not, and it's kind of counterintuitive. So if you're looking at a product page that has, tens or dozens of products on it in a list and every tiny thumbnail has an alt tag that explains what's in that image the screen reader is going to get buried in reading these descriptions that are really not useful to the person visiting the website like the descriptions that are useful to them are the actual written summary descriptions so it could take you know tens of minutes to a screen reader to go through all of this text on the page um, so you know, it's it's not just a blanket like everything needs alt tags. Like there there is uh, a science to how you apply this to uh, to the websites. Yeah, you're and you're referencing there decorative versus non decorative images, right? What images are useful? What aren't? And that's that's what that's what I think is important to note about overlays. And we'll get into technical limitations here in a second. But in terms of what I've I've heard predominantly from individuals with disabilities is that they do not rely on these tools. And in fact, when they can, they actively avoid them. And there have been numerous studies that show this um, that these tools can conflict with the assistive technology that people are already using. You know, they've already configured their browser, they've already configured their screen reader, but these tools have, you know, similar solutions that mimic those things baked into the little widget um, that are just conflicting or causing significant issues for these users. That doesn't mean to say that overlays are completely useless, but I think that their application is incredibly limited and every, every person who I've spoken with, you know, if they happen to be blind, if they happen to be deaf, whatever it is, uh, because we engage with a lot of those people by virtue of the accessibility testing services that we do, um, because we want to use people who have real world experience using this stuff in their day to day. Um, most of them, almost all of them, frankly, will say, uh, you know, overlays. No, we don't. We don't like those. We think that they're rubbish. Right. And that's where it can, um, it can really it can really be hard to discern when or if you should use one um, on the technical limitation front, which I'll I'll kind of segue into that a little bit. Um, like Chris Miller astutely pointed out with the SEO versus SEM comparison, right? If you're paying an overlay and relying solely on an overlay to fix your accessibility problems, which as we've established is debatable that it even does that super reliably. Um, the second you decide to cancel that subscription, unless you've been actively fixing things in the background, um, all of those fixes are now gone and you're back to where you're, you started, um, which is not a good position to be left in. And so that's why native fixes should always be the preferred solution. And I think um, where we can maybe wrap this slide up and, and try to get to audience questions, because I know we're running up against time, um, is just the idea of like how to approach, do I use an overlay or not? Um, what, I'll, what I'll lead with, and then Chris, I wanna give you the final word here on anything you wanna share is just um, to be able to, before you decide to use an overlay, I think having an understanding of how accessible or not your website is, at least at a high level, you know, can you move through it with a keyboard? Are the automated tests coming back almost completely clean, right? Well, if your website seems to buy all the all the levers that you have to pull without bringing in a professional to be accessible, an overlay very well might make it worse. 
Whereas conversely, if your website is failing, almost every single check can't be used with a keyboard, it has barriers everywhere that is you know, visible to you through these testing methods, maybe an overlay will be a slight improvement to be implemented while you make real fixes. Um, and then Chris, I wanna let you close with your thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, I mean, if it's going to buy you some time to to catch up and fix the things under the hood, then great. But, um, you know, yeah, there's just no substitute for for doing the hard work. And, you know, uh, eventually, uh, you know, if you rely solely on an overlay, uh, eventually it's going to become problematic. So I think, you know, it's not a either or. It, it can be an and situation. And each case is different. You know, websites are all over the map uh, from a technical standpoint under the hood. And the problems that people run into with their own websites are going to vary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I wanted us to spend just a brief moment, maybe two minutes, just talking about the idea of finding good partners. Um, and then, uh, Chris, since there's four of these, maybe we can um, alternate. Um, but the idea of can they speak to an accessibility process if they're asked. Uh, what we mean by this is uh, if you ask them about accessibility, can they give a, a detailed response of what they would do to deliver you an accessible website? Yeah, I mean, if, if someone came to us four or five years ago and asked us about accessibility, we were like, yeah, there's plugins for that, you know, because we were ignorant, naive. And, uh, you know, we too thought that that was the solution. It wasn't until we dug into it that we really understood accessibility is just as complex as the types of websites that we build. You know, pe people don't realize how much technology and considerations and, and details under the hood there are. So, um, you know, it should be fairly easy to understand if, um, if the, the company that you're talking to has experience with it, if they're like, no, nah, you just need a plugin. You know, I would um, I would raise an eyebrow at that. I would dig in to see if they understand these details. The information that we presented to you today, hopefully that will help to educate you to be able to ask the right questions to determine if a partner really understands how to solve the problem or not. Because, you know, ultimately you're the one who's going to end up with a lawsuit if there is one um, and there's going to be little to nothing that's going to fall on the shoulders of, of the partner. All right. Um, and then I'm going to, just in the interest of time, because I want to get to q and I'm going to kind of move over this. Um, but uh, the, the short version here is to just pay attention to what the accessibility guarantees are, ask about them and look at them critically, depending on who you're looking to partner with. And I, Chris Miller and I both have strong opinions about this, but uh, we're a little bit pressed for time. So we're going to wrap up here and then get to the Q&A as quickly as we can. All right, great. Well, with that in mind, uh, we just wanted to recap uh, what we learned today. I'm not gonna read through the slides here. I hope that we've given you a wealth of information uh, that will truly be helpful to you starting your accessibility journey. And uh, with that, like, let's just get to the Q&A. All right, sounds good. So um, I have a couple that I've seen in the Q&A module and thank you to Alice and Vanessa for popping those in there. And then I, I've seen a few in the chat. Um, Paula, our lovely uh, woman behind the curtain, if you wouldn't mind just kind of skimming chat and seeing if you have more questions you could add to the Q&A module, if you spot any that didn't get addressed directly in the chat, that'd be awesome. Um, and anyone who's still on here, uh, would be welcome to add their questions as well. So uh, Alice asks, how do you find the back end of WordPress? Is that when you're in edit mode? Um, Chris, I'll let you take this one since it's not directly accessibility related, uh, yeah, that, more general. That depends on how the website is built. And there were a lot of questions or ref, uh, references to page builders, which I'd also like to touch on. So. Um, you know, there is a URL that you use to access to login to WordPress that gets you access to all of the back end. And there are several different tools and settings there, including editing, editing uh, web pages and, and posts. Um, if your WordPress website is using a third party page builder, then it depends. They're gonna have a way to be able to get to, um, to editing the page. 
I find many of them very convoluted and, and very difficult to manage. I am, I'm just going to say I'm biased. I am not a page builder fan. Um, we have used Divi in the past for what I would say, you know, low end entry level websites where there just isn't enough budget to be able to build it in a native WordPress way. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, and Alice, if I didn't address your question, just feel free to, to drop uh, more information in the Q&A. And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. come back to page builders in a minute here. Yeah. And Vanessa Johnson drops, are there plans to do a webinar about comparing the baseline accessibility from different web builders like Wix, Squarespace, WordPress, Shopify? Oh, that sounds like fun. Um, I think the number one thing with that that would, that would stop us is just um, like the core, the idea of the core experience for each of those platforms versus all the third party builders and all the third party integrations. And that, that right there is kind of the crux of the thing. I think the closer you get, not, not without, you know, exceptions, but the closer you get to the core of a product, like for instance, let's, let's say Elementor, the foremost page builder of WordPress. If you're just using Elementor core in the experience of us, including our CEO, Amber, our testers, Elementor core, if you're paying attention to color contrast and heading markup and, and things like that does a reasonably good job if you're paying attention to how you're putting things in of outputting accessible websites, right? Um, if you're doing it correctly in the input phase of setting everything up. Um, and I know I'm being a little vague there, but once you start adding all of these third-party integrations to your Elementor website, that's where you start to open the gates to potential accessibility problems getting introduced in third-party modules or, or add-ons or things like that. That's just been our experience. Um, trying to stay as close as you can to the core platform authors stuff, I think is a good initial step. It's not foolproof, um, and that's not an, an endorsement of any one of these particular platforms. Um, I think also uh, for any of these just uh, seeking documentation and asking pointed questions of sales representatives can get you uh, somewhere. Also, a lot of these tools have public demos and you can use some of the tests that anyone I can do that I, that anyone can do that I told you about, like using your keyboard on them, running wave on them to see if the public demonstrations of these various tools are observing baseline best practices, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I'd like to add on to that. Um, yeah. So with Squarespace, you know, we've done a number of sites with uh, Squarespace. Um, it's great for information only sites, you know, especially if there's, you know, you have a lower budget, you don't need all the power that WordPress can bring to the table. Um, it's a great platform for that. Um, but what it really boils down to is do they give you access to the settings under the hood? to make the changes that will, will make you pass because you are buying a website as a service. Yeah, we're hearing background noise here. Um, you're buying a website as a service. Uh, so they're giving you limited access and you really only need to do things like add code on the front end, lots of JavaScript to be able to, to do third-party integrations, unlike WordPress where uh, you have a lot more control under the hood of, of the back end. Um, so there may be things that you don't have access to, or maybe you just don't have access to them in the normal Squarespace interface. They do have some power tools where you can get a little bit further under the hood and impact CSS and, and whatnot. So um, yeah, I mean, Squarespace sites tend to be more, more simple. Uh, hopefully there's less to have to refine there, uh, you know, from an accessibility standpoint uh, compared to, you know, WordPress sites tend to be more complicated because the companies who build on WordPress are taking advantage of the, the power and extending those sites. Um, and then the final question that we've got in the Q&A module um, is what about accessibility of documents that are on the website? How do we fix these? Um, and I apologize if you're getting a little bit of cross chatter from my mic. I'm going to try to just lean in close to my mic so that you're mostly hearing my voice. Um, but uh, I think this is a great question and something that we didn't really address in the uh, presentation, which is websites are more than just the sum of their web pages. They can also have videos on them. They can have PDFs on them. They can have audio files embedded in them, streaming 
video, all of these sorts of integrations. And there is a lot in terms of what can be done to make sure that those components are also accessible. And there are companies that specialize in making PDFs and videos accessible, et cetera. Um, I'll mute again, but Chris, if you want to wrap that one up, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, uh, PDFs and other types of media are, are definitely part of a website. And, uh, you know, I know less about uh, the, the document world as, as far as that uh, goes. I, I definitely uh, defer to you on that. Um, what, what I would like to uh, jump into, if I may, is the, uh, the page builders, right? So um, the reason that we have page builders in WordPress is because WordPress originally had what we called a WYSIWYG editor or a what you see is what you get. And it's like editing a Google Doc or a Word Doc. And when websites became responsive, that instead of building a separate website for mobile, we build one website and we design the theme to work on desktops and tablets and mobile phones and make Google Glass there for a while, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, all these different screen sizes, um, it made the structure of the web pages more complicated and the WYSIWYG editor just doesn't cut it. And nobody who's a marketing person or a non-technical person wants to deal with HTML tags, you know, it just gets in your way, right? So a bunch of enterprising folks decided, hey, you know, we're gonna build a custom experience inside of WordPress to make it easier. And these were well-intended. I think one of the problems that I have with, with page builders is that they work in a very counterintuitive way compared to WordPress. So you have your WordPress workflow, but when you go to editing a page, um, it's very different. Uh, in fact, I just edited a Divi website recently and you're presented with a bunch of bars and it's like, well, where's the block of content that I wanna edit? You know, I have to kind of click through there. To be fair, there are some full page editing experiences that are starting to emerge where you can just edit right on the page and that's a, it's a much better experience. But um, you know, eventually the WordPress core team caught up and they introduced something about, I wanna say four or five years ago now called Gutenberg. And this is the native WordPress experience in editing these pages. And the WordPress core team is about, I'd say 70% down their roadmap for Gutenberg. Uh, so that, that is to say that they're continuing to add features to it, but it, it's, it's becoming very mature. Um, our agency, we stopped building the traditional style of themes about three years ago. We're doing everything in Gutenberg. And I, there's part of me that believes that Gutenberg, once complete, is just going to replace these page editors uh, entirely. WordPress as a platform has continued to evolve. And the folks over at Divi are actually having to uh, reimagine what Divi looks like under the hood. They're, they're currently, they're maybe a year into uh, a complete overhaul of Divi. Uh, and it's got, it's got to be a huge and challenging endeavor. I don't know if we can expect things to be backwards compatible or not. I'm going to guess not. Um, but Divi is having to completely re-engineer their platform because the underneath of WordPress is changing and they need to play nicely with Gutenberg, right? Um, Elementor, yes, very popular one. Uh, I, I know of Beaver Builder, it tends to be popular with some marketing people. Um, I hadn't heard of Bricks, I'll have to, to take a look at that. But um, yeah, I mean, use a page builder if you have to, if it is just the, the fastest path, your budget constrained, you know, consider it. Um, but I, I would greatly encourage you to consider Gutenberg and there are professional plugins that can uh, extend what Gutenberg is doing to give you more of that on page building experience. Um, yeah, so that, that's my rant on, on page builders, but you know, like my, my dad and my early employers taught me, you know, there's a value to doing things right the first time, you know, if you're able to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that about wraps us up. We're out of items in the Q&A question. Chris Miller, thank you so much for being here. Paula, thank you so much for your work behind the scenes. And thank you to Texas Closed Captions for their captioning work. And of course, thank you to all of our lovely attendees. 
There will be uh, slides available uh, if they haven't already been shared. You will also be able to access the recording of this as an on-demand webinar anytime 24-7. Um, and you are free and welcome to, if you found what we shared helpful, uh, share this webinar with your friends, with your coworkers, if you think that they'll find it valuable. And of course, reach out to Chris Miller at uh, Launch Brigade or myself at Equalize Digital if you need any sort of help with any of the things that we discussed today. Uh, thank you all so much for being here and we will see you next time. All right, thank you everyone. We really appreciate you joining.